Good afternoon. It's wonderful to have you all here. Uh, those of you who have been coming routinely, whether you're an enrolled student or a community member, to our Thursday noon series, know, know that this is an ongoing series on video art in context, one that is coupled with and embedded within a large public lecture class that focuses on the form aesthetically, politically, and also in terms of its economics and technology. This course, the series, uh, all of the teaching, um, all of the speaking speakers and visiting speakers are um, funded thanks to a generous donation from the Cramlick Art Foundation, advancing that foundation's mission uh, in, the, uh, in education, public engagement in the field of time-based media art. Those of you who have come here before also have heard me invoke the Cramlick Art Foundation a few times, a foundation started by the founders of um, the, uh, also, uh, the also appropriately named Cramlick Art Collection, a, collector, a collection known throughout the world for its innovation and forward thinking in investing and collecting in video and media art. There is a particular synergy today uh, in getting to introduce uh, our guest and the top of, of her lecture in relationship to the Cramlick Art Foundation, and I'll say more of that as I go. So first of all, uh, to start with the speaker who we have in, um, before us, Julie rodriguez Widholm, is the executive director at UC Berkeley's uh, Art Museum, BAM, BAM PFA, that is Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific, Pacific Film Archive, where she leads the strategic and artistic vision to promote community building, new scholarship, equity and interdisciplinary learning and exhibitions, collections, and programs here at our own museum. Prior to BAM PFA, Rodriguez Woodholm was director and chief curator of the DePaul University Art Museum, where she launched a multi-year Latinx art initiative. And before that, she was a curator at the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago, specializing there in global contemporary art and artists of Latin America. Her curatorial projects have been featured throughout the country and world, including at museums um, such as the Solomon um, Guggenheim Museum, Perez Art Museum in Miami, the Nasher Museum at Duke University, <clears throat> the MIT List Visual Arts Center, and many other spots. Throughout her curatorial work, Rodriguez Woodhome, it should be said, has also been a force in leading um, and guiding a range of diversity initiatives within the wider museum world, giving space to underrepresented female artists and underrepresented artists of color. At the same time, her exhibitions also address those privileged by systems of gender, those privileged by systems of race and systems of colonialism and the legacies of slavery, asking all viewers to reckon with our relationship to histories of oppression and discrimination. That double goal of representing underrepresented voices and making sure that no one sees themselves um, in a, a neutral or, or non-implicated position vis-a-vis -vis, uh, um, those artworks has very, is very much in operation in the exhibition that she has just opened at BAM PFA yesterday and about which she'll speak today. The title of her exhibition, Out of Africa, uh, is uh, an exhibition that draws largely from the works, works of the Cramlet Collection um, and invokes the title of Isaac Dennison's Out of Africa, a book written from the perspective of early 20th century colonial privilege and exploitation in Kenya. Rodriguez Widholm creates in, our ex in the exhibition on the lower floors an elegant assembly of photographs and video art that center on the continent of Africa as a site of extraction, exploitation, and displacement for economic gain. As she says in her curatorial statement, many past and ongoing wars in Africa are related to control over mining natural resources, which has caused widespread humanitarian and environmental crises. The removal of labor and natural resources from South Africa, the Democratic Republic of, Cong of Congo, and Namibia is critically explored by artists such as William Kentridge, Richard Moss, and Doug Aitken, respectively. 
The exhibition begins with a photograph by Carrie Mae Weems that depicts a historical center for trade in Mali, while British filmmaker and artist Steve McQueen's landscape offers a sober meditation on the racist experience by millions of people in the United States after being forcibly display, displaced from the African continent as slaves, unquote. In assembling this collection of works, some artworks created by white artists, some by black artists, Rodriguez Woodholm has launched another potent conversation about power, oppression, and privilege as all of us grapple with the legacies of colonialism and our different and unequal positions within those legacies. So we're thrilled that she has agreed to extend that conversation for us today, and I hope you'll join me in welcoming Julie Rodriguez Wildham. Thank you so much, Shannon, and thank you for this opportunity to collaborate in this way. My first opportunity to speak to a UC Berkeley class. I'm honored and very excited. Um, and also thank you to the Cramlet Collection team who was very, very helpful in putting together this exhibition, my colleagues at Cal Performances and the Townsend Center, um, of course my colleagues throughout the museum here. This has really been a collective effort in putting together an exhibition on fairly short notice, taking, oppor taking an opportunity when it presented itself. Um, around the Kentridge residency. So today I just want to talk to you sort of in maybe three chapters. One, just briefly about some of my, my background, how I sort of arrived here, which um, Shannon alluded to a little bit in my bio. Um, how the show was put together, you know, sort of talking you through what it takes to put together an exhibition, and then delving a little bit more into the individual works themselves. And then we'll leave some time for Q&A at the end, and then I will invite everyone to actually go down into the galleries to see the, the show in person, because there's nothing like seeing artwork in three dimensions in real life. There's no replacement for it. Um, so I began um, sort of my career, if you will, as an undergrad at the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana, and I was a volunteer of the Cranard Art Museum. So academic art museums at large public universities have a dear and near place in my heart. Um, it's where my interest in contemporary art, international affairs, came together in museum spaces and really solidified what I wanted to do with my life. So I take great honor in leading the, the museum here at UC Berkeley. Um, I then spent 16 years as a curator of contemporary art. That's my training, a curator of contemporary art at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago. Um, I, you know, I curated all kinds of shows, collection exhibitions, contemporary exhibitions with emerging artists, established artists, and I worked in all media, really all media, performance, photography, video, sculpture, you name it. Um, I've worked with artists, and I, and I would consider myself a curator who really follows an artist's lead, and, and I think artists are some of the great thinkers of our time, and um, really think their research and their explorations guide us to places that we may not find on our own. And so my job as a curator is to really bring that kind of research, knowledge, discovery um, to a public, and to engage in a public dialogue. So after 16 years at the Museum of Contemporary Art, I went to DePaul Art Museum at DePaul University. Um, I was very excited to move from a civic art museum to an academic art museum. This is in the heart of Chicago. And our kind of mission there was very much tied to the mission of the university at DePaul Art Museum, which is the Vincentian Catholic University. It's the largest Catholic university in the country where there's a strong social justice mission. And so we were working within the museum space as well to think about how can exhibitions, how can art, how can building our collection and building our community tie directly into um, a social justice mission as well and give space, resources, visibility to historically marginalized artists and also become a, a welcoming space for a large number of the students there at DePaul who were first generation college goers, weren't um, necessarily um, students who went to museums growing up and we wanted to create a, a space for them to feel welcome and, and engaging with us. And then just two and a half years ago, I came to Berkeley. So I'm pretty new here. Um, I am uh, been director for about two and a half years. And I came to Berkeley because I really feel that the work that needs to be done within museums today, and there's a lot of work that we need to do in museums to um, be truly 21st century museums and responsible and relevant to our communities and the changing demographics of the country, um, and reckon with the colonial uh, foundations um, that really undergird what a museum is and the model of a museum. Um, I felt that 
doing the work to change museums to be more relevant, to be more reflective and embracing and um, in dialogue with, or even formed by the communities that we serve, could really be done here with this incredible you know, community of faculty, students, but also the great social histories of change here in the Bay Area as well. So I'm thrilled to be here, thrilled by our mission to be dedicated to both art, film, and student engagement and teaching and learning. I also, you know, do all of my work from the perspective that museums are not neutral. You know, there is a, a kind of, there was anyway for decades, I think this is now over the last maybe five years, been challenged to the point of it, um, it one can no longer argue that museums are objective spaces of authoritative um, hmm, fact. I mean, I think they need to be trustworthy institutions, but museums are not neutral spaces. They're run by human beings, they're run by people, we make decisions based on who we are in the world, what our values are, what we care about. Um, and I'm, I'm interested in how museums can reckon with that fact and be more transparent and clear about what do we care about, why are we doing the work that we do, and not feign objective notions of quality, um, which really we all know reflect those who are in power. And for museums, for you know, 100 years, it was predominantly a white patriarchal system that was running museums. And the decisions on what to show, what not to show, were really based on their senses of value. And then this poster that you might find in some you know, funny shop in the mall or something. Do malls even exist? I don't know. Well, they used to. <laughs> um, this history of art. You know, it, it's supposed to be funny, kind of irks me because this is not the history of art. You know, Da Vinci, Rembrandt, Monet, Van Gogh, Picasso, Dali, Rothko, Pollock, Warhol, right? This is the, the European art, histor art history that we're taught in school. This is what I was taught as an undergrad um, with a little bit more. But these are all just, you know, white men who have risen to the top. And, and to even caricature their work in a way, it's, you know, it doesn't take their work seriously, which I think we should take their work seriously. But what I'm trying to do um, in my work is really think about expanding this canon, blowing open the fact that these are, you know, nine artists that we all may know. Um, they're very famous artists, but there are thousands of artists that we should know who reflect other kinds of aesthetic um, explorations, experiences, um, and such. So that's what we're trying to do. And then also thinking about how our role at, the, at, the, at UC Berkeley really is tied directly to the mission of the university, right? Well, if we think about knowledge and activism on the left, on um, um, thinking about how we contribute to knowledge, and well, I think generally we center artists' contributions to culture and knowledge. Um, art can be beautiful, but art does a lot more than that, right? Art can truly be research, it can truly be discovery, um, it truly opens our eyes to new forms of knowledge. And similarly, thinking about our, our place, this site of um, activism and social change, I want the museum to be a place that is also changing the course of art and film history and the future of art museums by truly becoming a more diverse, inclusive, and innovative museum. Um, there's a lot of you know, desire to, for change in museums, but not always a lot of action to accompany it. So I'm really excited to think about how can we look and feel different um, to truly uh, fulfill our mission the best we can. And in terms of our vision, we really want to be at the forefront of cultural change in museums, right? Society has changed so much in the last few years, but also it's been changing for decades. And the world has changed, but museums really haven't. Museums have kind of been very stubborn in thinking about who they are and what they do and the way they do it. And it's time to push against that and change that. And we feel like the MPFA is a place to do that because, like I said, we're in Berkeley. This is the site of social innovation and change. It's in our DNA. We have a history of radical um, exhibitions and per performance art and experimentation. And we want to channel that history and, and um, be bold and fearless in our pursuit of change inside and out. Um, and then if I think about kind of the intersections that we work within, and this is just one Venn diagram of many I could have created and shared, but I do think that at the center of what we do is learning, lifelong learning, right? Of course, academic learning at UC Berkeley is very important, but I also love to think of museums as a site of lifelong learning for all ages, all generations. Um, and how do we function at the intersection of the local and the global? That's very important to who we are and, and what we program, but also artistic innovation and social justice as well. 
In terms of our program, and that means collections, exhibitions, um, a collection. So we have a collection of 28,000 artworks and about 16,000 films and videos. So we have a lot of art and film in our collection. And we bring a contemporary critical perspective to global collections and exhibitions by making connections across generations and geographies. Art and film from the past and present inform each other. So where you might have been to a museum where everything seems kind of separate and distinct in its geography or its region or its era, I'm interested in how we can create conversations across time. Um, and I also want us to be a place that is uniquely BAM PFA, right? How are we going to tell the story of the Berkeley area, of the Bay Area, past, present, and future? I don't want us to look exactly like a museum in LA, a museum in New York, a museum in Seattle, right? And I want us to be distinct. And also want us to show more of the collection all of the time. So after Out of Africa closes, we're going to be turning the whole lower level into um, ongoing collection space. And I'm excited to think about how we can bring more of the collection out. We're starting a teaching gallery where faculty can choose some works to have on view for a semester at a time. Um, Cal Conversations is a, ser a series where we'll work with a faculty member and their class, their students, to curate a show from our collection, too. Um, a strong commitment to global and local um, black, Asian, and Latinx artists, women, LGBTQ artists, thinking about whose stories are we not seeing in museums and how can we look for them and bring them to the center. Also new scholarship, shaping a new canon. I also think it's incredibly important that we realize that what we show in museums does affect how art history is written, um, what students learn, and UC Berkeley has an incredible legacy of really defining art historical narratives itself with so many um, esteemed art historians here. And then we have a series called Matrix, which uh, has been around since 1978. It's a very long running series of emerging artists. Generally, it's, it's evolved over time. And we're trying to think about how we can bring multiple curatorial voices into that series. So keep an eye out for that. Um, and then when you may have noticed we have this giant outdoor screen on the side of the building and trying to activate that as a site of public art as well. How can we use that as a kind of community TV or digital art space or really kind of thinking about that as a site for public art? And then I am inspired by this quote I came across by the poet and theorist Edouard Glissant. Um, he envisioned a museum that would not only point at urgencies, but also find agency to respond to these urgencies. He imagined it to be a quivering place, transcending established systems of thought and looking for the utopian point where all the world's cultures and all the world's imaginations can meet and hear one another. And this is so beautiful to me to think about urgency, right? And in some ways I feel um, when I'm curating a show, I want, I want it to feel somewhat urgent, like why are we doing this now? Um, but also quivering in, implies something that maybe isn't super stable. It's a little like, it's, you know, we don't know exactly what this is. There's some energy in it. Um, and transcending established systems, right? Thinking about and acknowledging this is the way it has been, but how could it be? And thinking through our imagination to what is possible. And then also this notion of world's cultures and imaginations meeting, not just meeting, but actually hearing one another. How can we be a space for dialogue and critical dialogue together and artistic dialogue? Okay, so that's kind of an intro to who we are at BAM PFA. And then out of Africa, selections from the Cramlet Collection. So this show came together fairly quickly. I will say generally we try to plan shows maybe over the course of a year or two or three. Um, but there were some exciting things happening. Actually, let me go to this slide. Um, that, well, first of all, there was a sort of last minute opening in our schedule that allowed the possibility of having the work by William Kentridge on site at a moment on campus when we were doing a lot with this very world renowned, important artist, William Kentridge. So, this, these are the kind of factors that were at play um, that I was trying to bring together when thinking about this exhibition. So William Kentridge um, is having a residency on campus um, through Cal Performances. He's doing um, some performances actually next week. Um, 
we're doing a film retrospective of his here, and the Townsend Center also is co-host. And then when Shannon told me that she was also working on this video art class and with support from the Kramlicks and the Kramlick Collection, I, she introduced me to, to Pam Kramlick, who is the uh, head of the Kramlick Collection, to think about would there be a possibility to show some of their video art from their class, uh, sorry, from their collection at the museum to coincide with this very class here. And then we had a very small window in our exhibition calendar um, because we do tend to program, you know, a year or two out ideally. Um, we had this little spot open um, because we're planning to have our annual fundraiser in the galleries for the first time in um, May. So it was sort of these convergence of things and I thought, ooh, if we can make this work, it'd be really amazing because William Kendridge is such an important artist, South African artist, and the opportunity to show video, which we haven't done um, very much lately and haven't done so much in these lower level galleries. And I was excited to explore how, how, how can we learn about how these spaces function with video art in them. Um, they're very low light spaces. There's not a lot of natural light down here. So I thought, oh, it could be, could be perfect for video art. Let's try it. Um, so we kind of, uh, through a very many, many conversations with multiple um, stakeholders, landed on a grouping of works by these artists, Digaken, William Kentridge, Richard Moss, Carrie Mae Weems, and Steve McQueen. And I'll kind of walk you through. Um, I mean, putting together an exhibition is both a matter of kind of curatorial, artistic um, thinking, but also there's a lot of pragmatic um, aspects of putting together a show that will potentially limit what we can show. Um, so this is kind of how I start <laughs> putting together a show. It's like a handwritten little, some ideas. I start to brainstorm. Um, you know, once I knew what was available from the Kramlick collection, what could fit, um, what made sense in my mind around a theme, I started with the Kentridge work um, that I'll talk about later and then kind of built some other works around it. And I noticed within the Kramlick collection, there were a few other video art pieces or art photography um, that were cited in Africa and engaging with the subject matter of extracting resources from Africa um, in various ways. And I personally, as a, in my background, I lived in Mozambique for a couple of years, and so I have a personal interest also in the subject matter. And so I started building around and thinking about what could work in this space. And so this was sort of, you know, draft one, very, you know, hand-drawn. And then we start moving to getting some digital images of the works, looking at the layout that we have that we use for all of our shows. And you'll see there are dimensions for all of the walls. And this is easy just to do in, you know, Adobe Acrobat. We just kind of start moving things around. It's not necessarily to scale, but enough to see where things might work. So these, this is the gallery layout side by side, two different versions of what we were considering, what I was thinking about, um, just to show you. And then this is the second gallery where I was also playing around with, okay, could we have the Kentridge, which is on the bottom left, um, the McQueen, which is on the top, and then another artist's work on the right. And then version two on the right was, okay, what if we had the Doug Aitken piece, very large, and then another video work. And we determined that really to have these two video works in the same space was just gonna be too much sound conflict. Um, so we ended up moving things around. This is the final layout. Um, Kentridge in this other space on the top right, Carrie Mae Weems, the photograph when you walk in, the moss on the left, and then the C. McQueen white box on the bottom, and then the um, Doug Aiken very large scale projection um, in its own gallery because it has quite a resonant sound. But we had to put, you know, we had to make sure we had the right equipment. Um, that We also work with our um, colleague here, Alex Confer, does these 3D sketch up layouts. Once we know kind of what works are going to specifically be in the show and he can start mocking them up to scale. So we move from the 2D to the 3D layout. Um, we had to have a lot of conversations um, not just with the lenders, but also with the artists to figure out, okay, do we have the right equipment? Do we have the right projectors? Do we have the right speakers? What is the throw? Um, do we need sound panels? So these black forms here, those are all sound panels on the walls to kind of absorb some of the sound. 
um, there were some issues with the light leading into the space, and so we had to figure out how to block the light, and we came up with the curtains that we um, could use that were approved by the fire marshal. So there are a lot of steps that go into <laughs> putting together what I thought was going to be a fairly simple exhibition with five artworks in it. Um, turned out to not be so simple. Video is, is not as simple as one would think it is um, to, to curate and put into a show. We also were in conversation with the artists themselves to figure out what the studios require, um, you know, what's important to them. They shared with us, for example, Doug, Ak Doug Aiken wanted a very specific blue paint color for the walls, um, so we had to find that paint color. And you know, we're really trying to achieve the artist's vision as much as possible um, while working within the limitations of our space, our budget, and the time we have to put together this exhibition. Um, on the left is an example of a checklist. This is what we use to keep track of all the artworks in the exhibition, the dimensions, um, the credit lines, and then any notes. And then on the right is just an example of the extended labels that we also are writing concurrently while putting together the show. And you'll see um, on the walls in the, in the galleries. And I thank my colleague, Associate Curator Elaine Yao for her help with this, and also Anthony Graham, our new senior curator. Um, you'll see a little bit of a QR code there, too. I came across a video, I'm going to show you a clip, uh, that I thought was so good that I wanted our visitors also to have access to that. Um, so it's something you can watch on your phone or whatever through the QR code. So here is the, this is it. This is the show, right? This is the, the final iteration from that 2D to a SketchUp to reality. Um, I took these this morning. And in fact, what's kind of funny, not funny, it's part of the process, is that once you get the artwork on site, sometimes it tells you that it wants to be in a different space. And so I had the Carrie Mae Weems on the wall. This piece here, I actually was planning to show here. But once we got it in the, in the building, on the site, I thought, you know what, it's not, I think it would be better on this wall. So in real time, we were able to make that change and move the title wall here. Um, a little, I don't know, maybe just a little behind the scenes kind of curatorial fun facts. When um, our new designer, Bradley Emersino, and I were designing the title wall here, we were trying to think about what color made sense for this, you know, just for the title. It's a very simple, straightforward title. And we started looking at um, some of the metallics and thinking about, is there any way to tie in, you know, just the choices we make to the subject matter of the exhibition. And we found this copper vinyl that we could use. And I thought, oh, that's actually kind of brilliant in a way because it's adjacent to um, a picture from the Democratic Republic of, of Republic of the Congo where, you know, some of the largest mines of copper are in existence. And so in some ways when we're making shows, we're really trying to be thoughtful about why we're choosing to do what we do and um, to create meaning. Not that anyone would know that, but it's kind of, you know, it's a thoughtful gesture um, to put together work. So on the right is the William Kentridge video, which you'll see. Um, here's an a installation view of the Carrie Mae Weems on the left and the Steve McQueen lynching tree on the right. Um, there was a kind of um, arc of the experience of walking through the show that I was trying to achieve, which I had to somewhat compromise on, um, but that's okay. You know, sometimes you just have to work with the space as it is. And I, I think I'll also mention that having, having exhibitions that, right, we're try, we are trying to teach with our exhibitions and provide opportunities for, for learning and, and knowledge, but they also teach us. And I think allowing some space for um, even those of us at the, at the museum or the curators to really kind of figure out like, oh, what is this show actually doing? And sometimes we only learn by living with it over time. So I will know in two months a little bit more about what this exhibition is really doing than I do today, a day after just installing it. Because people also tell us, right? The audience will give us feedback. We'll learn about kind of relationships that maybe were accidental in, in the visual space and, and noticing either formal relationships or other that make it really kind of interesting, I hope. And then this is an installation shot of the Richard Moss, which is just huge. It's maybe, you know, nine feet by 17 feet. It's a very large um, photograph of the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, 
And this is the install shot of the Doug Aiken video. So we, he wanted a very dark space. It has dark blue walls. And then we also had to lay down carpet tile on the floor to absorb some of the sound um, and make it less re resonant. This building, I don't know if you've noticed, but it is extremely porous when it comes to sound. Like there's sound bleed everywhere, at every level. Um, so that's something we have to kind of contend with. I'm learning as we show uh, video art with sound. Okay, so now I wanna move on to tell you a little bit more about the specific works in the show, and then we'll invite you to ask any questions, and then we'll go downstairs. Am I okay on time, Jan? Okay. Um, so this is a work by Carrie Mae Weems, and you may notice that this is actually a work in the museum's collection. Um, I always take curatorial license to include a work if I want to from our collection, even though it is the majority of the work is from the Kramnik collection very generously lending work to us. But I wanted to include um, you know, a female identifying artist in the show if I could, that's always important to me. And this piece, it, it, I thought, provided a, a kind of nice um, point of entry, if you will, because it, it depicts a very historical place um, that was a site of, a very important site near Timbuktu of trade, of goods, spices, but also labor and, and slaves. Um, so I'm going to read the label for this one. The work of Carrie Mae Weems investi investigates the dynamics of sexism, class, political systems of power, and especially cultural identity as a black woman. This group of images is characteristic of Weems' photography from the 1990s, in which the geographies traversed by enslaved Africans, such as South Carolina's Sea Islands or the West Coast of Africa, are the subjects of her camera and personal responses. During her first visit to Africa in 1993, Weems made this architectural study in Jenna, Mali, an epicenter for salt, gold, and the slave trade dating back to the 15th century. Known for its distinct adobe architecture, Jenna Geno is now a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Weems noticed the resemblance between the anthropomorphic qualities of the ancient buildings and the female form, which is emphasized in her images. Karen May Weems is also a UC Berkeley alumna. So then we move on to the Steve McQueen. Um, this piece, Lynching Tree, from 2013. Uh, oh, you'll notice I, I haven't curated the show in any way that's chronological. You're not going from, like, the earliest to the most recent. Um, it's really more spatial and content relationships. Um, so starting with the Carrie Mae Weems, which is this very historical 15th century site, and then there's the Steve McQueen, um, who's a British, um, a black British artist, um, which depicts a site in the United States in a white dominant space. And lynching tree refers, of course, to the horrors of lynching that took place in this country to those who were um, forcibly removed from you know, the continent of Africa. And this is the fate that some of them uh, faced. So the mature tree with thick sprawling limbs surrounded by greenery at the center of this photograph marks a site of horror, of terror. As Steve McQueen's title indicates, this oak tree was used for the gruesome hangings of people, of black people by white vigilante mobs in Louisiana. Their unmarked graves lie beneath the tree. Throughout US history, such extra legal murders were public spectacles intended to strike terror among African Americans and enforce white supremacy. In this color transparency, Queen not only memorialized lynching victims, but also called forth the injustice of their violent deaths which the peaceful landscape obscures. In training the camera on this outdoor site, McQueen further reopened the space of nature for black people who historically escaped to the woods for collective gathering and spiritual healing. McQueen took this photograph in Louisiana in 2012. While he was filming 12 Years a Slave, the true story of Solomon Northrup. Like this feature film, and so this was a feature film of, of his, um, and Small Acts, the artist's recent anthology series about West Indian immigrants in late 1960s and 1980s London, Lynching Tree centers the humanity of black diasporic protagonists who confront and resist racism in post-colonial contexts. So Steve McQueen is actually 
I would say, better known for his moving image work, um, both in gallery spaces and feature film. So this is somewhat distinct in that it is a, it is a photograph, but it is a light box. It's transparency that has a light behind it that shines through. So you, when you see in the galleries, you can um, see that light. And I wanted to share with you, just for context and understanding the span and range that an artist can take in their work, um, and because this image was taken directly from the making of this film, just a very short clip of this trailer of 12, 12 Years a Slave. I want to ask you what part of the country you come from. I originate from Canada. I guess where that is. Well, I know where Canada is. I've been there myself. Well, travel for a slave. Solomon Northup is an expert player on the violin. I was born a free man. Lived with my family in New York. Be good for your mother. Till the day I was deceived. To Solomon. Kidnapped. Sold into slavery. Well, boy, how you feel now? Uh, the, this is um, an example of an installation view of his work at the Whitney Museum of Art to show a different iteration of his, you know, in work and more of a gallery installation um, type setting, which actually reminds me when we first started talking, Shannon, I was thinking about curating a show about artists who work between gallery presentation and film cinematic presentation. That's, that was the original. Um, yes. Yes, exactly. That's right, Kate McKay, because we have an amazing film team. Um, and in some ways, that thinking did evolve into the presentation of the Pitchpong Versicical piece that's in our collection that's on view in Gallery 7 out here. Uh, but yeah, that, that is also a very interesting, I think, place for exploration, particularly for us here at BAM PFA, is that um, uh, artists who are oscillating between the two, which are very different. You know, to work in film is very different than to work in video and, and um, gallery installation spatially. So then we have um, William Kentridge, and I hope those of you who are um, interested and available to take advantage of all of the offerings of his on campus in the next probably 10 days will do so, because he really is an extraordinary artist um, in, in so many ways and so interdisciplinary in his movement between opera, um, you know, gallery presentations, video installation, um, we'll be having some of his um, short films on view on our outdoor screen for about a month or so, so people just walking by can see them. Um, but this piece in particular, Other Faces, which is the work in the Cramlet collection, I'll tell you a little bit about. It's from 2011. It's a single channel video um, projection. It has sound and color. It's about nine and a half minutes long. Um, and I'll read a little quote that I found wonderful about um, Kentridge's approach to his material, charcoal drawing. He says, the great thing about charcoal is its flexibility, that you can make a mark, hit it with a cloth, and it will more or less disappear, but it leaves a trace of the thinking behind it. It's about the paper and the charcoal doing something that is not pristine. It shows the mess of thinking. So Other Faces is part of William Kentridge's best known body of work, which is called Drawings for Projection. This ongoing series of animations uses a camera to capture large-scale large scale charcoal images that are drawn, erased, and redrawn. So the videos that you'll see, are, you see that action. He's the son of a lawyer who fought for human rights in South Africa. Kentridge offers critical social commentary on the post-apartheid era from the perspective of a white South African. Apartheid, which is an Afrikaans term for apartness, was an explicitly racist legal system based on segregating white people from non-white people that was in place in South Africa from 19, 1948 to 1991. In the film, Soho Eckstein, a recurring character in Kentridge's films who often wears a dark pinstripe suit, is a white South African mining magnate who reckons with his country's evolution from apartheid to democracy and the rapid changes within Johannesburg, the largest city in South Africa. So mining is also an important subtext to so much of the work in this exhibition as well. Eckstein grapples with his own increasing guilt, alienation, and nostalgia. Scenes from Eckstein's childhood flicker on a movie screen, 
atop the Top Star Mine Waste Dump south of downtown Johannesburg. This mine dump has historically separated the city's neighborhoods and classes. Um, as you'll see in the video, Eckstein's experiences several real and metaphorical collisions. There's a car crash, conflicts between locals and immigrants, and the clash of the past and the present. Any of these could symbolize the widespread class and racial anxiety in post-apartheid South Africa, where violence, injustice, and poverty persist. Other faces also depicts rampant xenophobia, particularly aimed at migrants coming to South Africa for work. I just want to share this um, short video uh, that talks specifically about a, little, a drawing from, the, the, um, from other faces, but also I think illuminates and shows a little bit more about their work. Oops, let's go back here. The charcoal drawing by William Kentridge is one of many he created for his 10th stop frame animation called Other Faces. It is also uh, called the Chronicle, uh, the Soho Chronicles, and you will see uh, in this particular drawing many examples of the manner in which Kentridge goes about creating these uh, stop frame animation forms. The driving screen uh, in this particular work also lending itself ideally for projection of all sorts of images that Cambridge integrates in this particular film. Scenes from his childhood, from uh, his parents, from his first love, and from his experiences in, uh, in and around Johannesburg. The main character is, of course, uh, Soho Eckstein, the archetypal capitalist, and he is often pitted against his foil, a character called Felix Teitelbaum, the archetypal lover and a poet. In this particular uh, film, Other Faces, it, it centers on the life of Soho Eckstein and of the many conflicts he experiences in a completely different Johannesburg, a Johannesburg that has changed from the invented hills, as Kentridge called them, from those mine dumps at the south of the city center to a reinventing itself in the progressive mining technology. And in the end, of course, this particular screen also had to go. Soho Eckstein wanders through the city center and he is involved in many clashes. Car crashes, clashes with other cultures, uh, clashes in his mind as he remembers his past. And in a manner, the city of Johannesburg not only becomes the context of his experiences, but also who's talking about how Johannesburg is sort of a character also in the films. And then I wanted to share a picture of this installation, which is now in a major exhibition of Kentridge's in Los Angeles at the Broad Museum. And here, I thought it was quite interesting to see, again, if we think about the various ways in which video can be presented, um, Kentridge worked with the curator there, Ed Shad, to create these little sort of structures within the gallery space, very simple, basic wood frame sculpture, uh, sculpture, maybe short, sculptures, structures, um, to sit within with these kind of old fashioned wooden chairs and um, watch the videos in that way. And then the last piece, not the last piece, the second to last piece I'll talk about is Doug Aiken's Diamond Sea. So this is the oldest work in the show. This is from 1997. So in terms of video art, I mean, video art, when you say video art, sort of started as an art form in the 60s. Okay, <laughs> okay, <laughs> in the 60s. Um, the 90s, I think there was definitely a kind of resurgence of interest in video art at the time. Um, Doug Aiken is an LA-based American artist, and uh, I'll tell you a little bit about this piece. So. The, the, this is a single channel version. There's a multi channel version of this video as well, but we're presenting the single channel video projection. Um, Diamond Sea connects two seemingly opposed images of Namibia's landscape. So, this is in Southwest Africa. It's sublime, seemingly untouched sand dunes and the highly mechanized territory known as Diamond Area 1 and 2. This region, known as the Forbidden Area, or Spergebiet, if you speak German, operates today as the world's largest and richest computer-controlled diamond mine. It is a tightly secured space surrounded by maximum security devices, floodlights, and patrolling helicopters, which a Aiken included to in invoke the specter of the political forces that have seized upon the region's natural resources for their own wealth. Colonial violence and the German genocide of the land's indigenous over Herero, San, and Nama nations at the start of the 20th century enabled German and political and, and British colonial entities to seize the land for diamond extraction. 
So, you know, a lot of European countries had the whole get grab for Africa in the late 1800s because there were so many resources, in, in, including diamonds. Even after Namibian independence from Germany in 1990, control of the forbidden area was handed to international mining cartels. In 2004, the region was designated as Tsao Kaheb National Park, a post-industrial nature reserve, another space where governments control human presence. To this day, indigenous people's calls for repossession of the land remain unheeded. As in his other multimedia works, Doug Aiken's experimental documentary approach, so it's not just a straight documentary, it is an experimental you know, sort of film, um, combines ambient sounds with recordings by artists such as Nine Inch Nails and Aphex Twin. And I think this is an important example in terms of thinking about mining and extraction of resources um, and the environmental and the human impact um, on the land. So this is uh, another installation view from a different presentation back in 2015, where it has three channels. And then Richard Moss's really kind of gorgeous um, piece, Love is the Drug, is from a larger series. And um, I've only seen images of this piece, actually, until I saw the real work in person when we installed it, and it's quite affecting. The deceptively picturesque Love is the Drug uses infrared film to bring at attention to the deaths of 5.4 million people in Central Africa due to post-colonial political and ethnic genocide and conflict over resources such as cobalt, copper, gold, tin, tungsten, and uranium. The humanitarian crisis in the remote eastern region of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and this is bordered by Uganda, Rwanda, and Burundi, is marked by rampant violence, especially sexual violence toward women, poverty, starvation, corruption, and illegal trade. By inserting otherworldly color into his photographic landscapes, Richard Moss offers more than a photojournalistic view of a conflict zone. And he has experience as a war photographer, so that's kind of where he's coming at this from. Working as an artist citizen, he wields beauty as, quote, the sharpest tool in the box, that's what he calls it, to bring the cost of war to the fore for the viewer. Love is the Drug uses an aerochrome film, which actually I have a short video to show you about, that was developed by Kodak during World War II at the request of the U American government to make camouflage, camouflage fabrics and nets visible from planes and helicopters. <laughs> Um, the film became commercially available in the 60s, but Kodak announced it would stop production in 2009. And Moss was, you know, was sort of ex excited to learn about it and then also wanted to use it. So he used the film to create a series of still images and then later returned to create a series of moving images when he found some um, moving image film available. So here's a little bit story about this very interesting film, which is what gets this magenta effect on the landscape in the Congo. Following his work on Infra, Moss then heard a rumor about an archive of 16 millimeter aerochrome film that was being stored in a deep freezer somewhere in the state of California. After almost a year of searching, he tracked the film down and was able to acquire 35 frozen reels of original aerochrome, each capable of capturing 11 minutes of footage. With aerochrome film in hand and a bulky, large 16 millimeter camera, Moss returned to Congo with cinematographer Trevor Tweeten, composer Ben Frost, and production assistant John Holton. Moss's goal this time was to create a short film that heightened the experience of infra with moving images and an original score. short film exhibited in galleries and museums alongside his still images. Enclave was not an educational film or documentary, but rather an experiential work, similar to his photography that 
transported viewers to the front lines of the Congolese War. Between infra and enclave, Moss's use of aerochrome can be easily misunderstood. Because on face value, when you look at the images, I mean, they almost appear to have been created using some type of cheap Instagram filter or some type of Photoshop effect. But it's worth remembering that Moss chose aerochrome deliberately. It was used with creative intent. Because when Moss learned about the origin of the film and how the military developed it to make the invisible visible, there was a clear connection there between the origin story of the film and what it was that he was trying to accomplish as a war photographer in the Congo, documenting a war that was mostly invisible and unknown to the outside world. Moss's use of aerochrome is also an ironic footnote in the film's history because, in many ways, his work in Congo helped repopularize infrared just as Kodak pulled the plug. And today, in 2020, over 10 years since the film was discontinued, there's barely any original aerochrome film left. You may find a few rolls and online auctions, but they are typically very expensive and very much expired. But while aerochrome film may be gone, it actually lives on today through digital technology. Next time in part two, I'm going to try and replicate the look of aerochrome film two ways. One, by using a full spectrum digital camera that captures infrared images straight out of camera. And then two, aerochrome camera profiles for Adobe Lightroom that are designed to stylize normal digital images to appear in. So I thought that was sort of interesting too, where he was thinking about how can we replicate this? Um, so I, I thought in the video he was going to explain how it works, but I just want to briefly explain to you the sort of technology of the aerochrome film as best as I can as a layperson. Um, so the film detects the infrared light that bounces off chloroplast and plants, which are invisible to the human eye, and it turns greens into lavenders and magentas and browns into deep blues. So this leaves artificial surfaces like camouflage uniforms and nets, sort of inert materials, detectable, if that makes sense. So it's sort of highlighting the thing that is actually natural chloroplast filled um, material um, and, and undermining what camouflage is trying to do, which is blend in with the natural shrubbery and trees and everything around it. And then I'll end here. Following his work on with these stories that came across my social media feed just in the last two weeks, um, right? So for me, this is not, a, it is in some way a historical look, but it's really a very timely subject matter that continues to be um, a, a global issue and one that I don't think is at the forefront of um, many conversations. The illegal mining trades are so, that causing such humanitarian crisis um, in regions around South Africa and the Congo and elsewhere. Um, so this article on the left, The New Yorker, which I sent to Shannon to share with you all, um, just to give some social context for this, this exhibition and also what is really happening right now as a, as a result of um, you know, extracting gold and diamonds and cobalt on the right. So cobalt, you know, is in all of our cell phones. We are complicit in this too. And how, uh, not to end on such a downer, but it's, it's the truth. <laughs> it's the reality. And I think um, it's important, you know, to, to think about this. And I hope the um, exhibition allows a sort of point of entry. It's a rather gentle point of entry, I would say, into these subjects um, for further exploration. Okay. Thank you. It's 106, so I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, perfect timing, I think, to be able to take uh, a few questions or comments or thoughts that are brewing from the audience before we also maybe venture out to see the exhibit. Any thoughts or questions? Yeah, Sierra? I, I'm very interested in your uh, ex exhibition planning process. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, like uh, this is this exhibition is majorly like um, things on flat surfaces, like video and like still images. But how would people in galleries plan like 3D installations, for example? Like how would people drag 
are people using images to put them into spaces or do people make 3D models? Yeah, yes. The answer is yes. Um, through 3D, through SketchUp, you can make a 3D form that and put it within the, the space, right? The gallery space. And you can kind of look at the footprint. If this sculpture is uh, four feet by four feet, you can kind of make a four foot by four foot blob or cube or square. I mean, I'm not very good at SketchUp. Maybe Alex, who's our chief preparator, could do a better job of approximating the real sculpture. But digitally, that's one way to do it. Um, for scale, to kind of see how much space it takes up. But there are some museums that have um, 3D, actual tangible 3D like foam core maquettes of the galleries with little sculptures maybe this big that you can kind of move around in the space too. Yeah, it's um, very helpful. How mm -hmm. about lighting, like some work including like neon lights, sort of like that? Yeah, it's fine. So we can, sh we can really show, I mean, there's not much we can't show here. Do you mean lighting with neon lights within the artwork itself? Mm -hmm. Yes. We've shown neon. We have some neon works in the collection. We just kind of plug it in. You know, we're, we're, we take care of the space, but we're also not overly precious about it because if an artist wants to do something on the floor, like we'll let them, you know, bolt into the floor or plug into the wall. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, great. And also, uh, students in this class, um, one of the options for a final project is to put together their own curatorial project, which might also have mm -hmm. a layout. We will just uh, let you use um, Adobe Acrobat, but you might want to challenge yourself to do to use other programs as well. Um, just for the curators and all of us, anyone who has a brewing question, can you raise your hand and we'll try to get to you? Anyone else? Okay, here. All right. Given that um, going through a museum and like experiencing art is the whole point of going to a museum, um, as a curator, do you consider like human behavior and the way that people traverse a museum? Like, is that does that go into the process of where you place certain pieces around the gallery? Yes, it does. Yeah, and I'm. Um still getting to know our space and how people traverse it. Um, and we're actually doing something, we're trying something a little bit new with this current set of exhibitions, which is to, when you walk in the museum, you know, you walk in, you have the big crane forum on your left, you can go straight into this theater. And I feel like for a lot of people, myself included, it was kind of confusing when you walked in the door to know where the galleries are, where to go. So we're trying a new thing, which is to encourage people to go down the Crane Forum and then turn right into that hallway and experience those four galleries from the central hall hallway rather than from the back, which was like you had to go up and down this big ramp to go into the galleries. Um, so that's one thing that we're trying just to see if it's easier for people to traverse it that way. But we also do think about space and crowding and hallways and doorways and not wanting to put signage too close to um, a doorway because we don't want it to be crowded. We think about ADA accessibility. We think about someone in a wheelchair being able to get around and across and through the space. Um, yeah, so we do. Hmm. Um, I'm wondering what is the uh, status of the outdoor monitor, which uh, when the museum was built was uh, going to be such an amazing display space for video work. And um, I know that uh, there was an issue with the, uh, with the community saying that it's too intense and too, I don't know, distracting or something. Uh, and in the last while, it's just been really used for advertising exhibitions at the museum, which is nice, but I think it's a real missed opportunity to have art out there. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, I totally agree. And we've started putting more and more art out there. Um, I had to do a little investigating to understand where that you know, thinking that we like really could not do anything but advertising our still images came from. And I feel confident that we can show more moving image. And so we have been working with the film curators to have film short films out there. Uh, the Kentridge will be a good example of having moving image um, on the hour and then the entire hour from 12 to 1, and I think 5 to 6, we'll have it out there. Um, we did a special project with Whitney Bradshaw, an artist who was invited from Chicago to do a project here 
portraits of women screaming were on view for several months leading up to the um, midterms elections in November. And then we also had a photo session with some UC Berkeley students whose portraits were then put on the outdoor screen. So we're absolutely interested in having it be activated more as an art space. Yeah, I think you're right. Uh, and trying to figure out when do we need to shut down the street and get a permit, you know, for obviously for our full feature film screenings, we have to do that. Um, but for the other things, I'm not sure. You know, I think we can have a little bit more leeway in what we show. Mm -hmm. The microphone there that it really has been up until a long time a really hard process with the city that did require us to shut everything down anytime we wanted to show anything else up there. So it's great that Julie's working on this if, as long as we can do it safely. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that like normally it takes like one or two years or even three years to plan an exhibition. Were there any challenges with like trying to get this exhibition done so quickly? Where's my team? Would you like to answer this for me? Yeah. <laughs> yes. I mean, it's never good to rush. You know, great things usually take some time. Um, I'm very proud of what we did accomplish in a very short time, and it's because of everyone's willingness and flexibility to kind of work very quickly while also working on other projects. Um, yeah, I mean, we have to make quick decisions. We have to find out, you know, kind of push the artist to respond to us quickly when you know, they have a lot of other things going on too. So it just takes a little bit of persistence to get the information we need to do it the right way. And then usually there's a kind of flow of the steps you take in organizing an exhibition. And I feel like in this one, we were kind of doing a lot of the steps all at once, which is, you know, decide, figuring out what is actually going to be in the show. And I we started writing the labels before we knew exactly what was in the show because we had to have them ready and then we had to have them edited you have to have them proofread, then you have to have them typeset and designed and, you know, ready. So to have all of that done in a compressed period, you're doing a lot of it simultaneously, which is not ideal. So um, a question I had was not about this exhibition, but the artist I won from a couple months ago. Mm -hmm. How was that different from working with like four different artists curating their own space than like you curating like the exhibit, the entire exhibit yourself? Yeah, good question. I mean, it's the artist I was certainly um, highly collaborative with a lot more moving parts and pieces and conversations. And that is a project that took at least two years to put together. Um, yeah, I think it's it's um, when you're working with four guest curators, or really with any guest, guest curators, there's a kind of learning curve of understanding how do we work internally as an organization, and then how do we help them, right? How do we help guest curators use our collection, find out what we have, um, figure out, what understand what our process is for putting together an exhibition, like all the steps I just mentioned. Um, I would say the artist side was a much, much, much bigger undertaking. Um, and and I, I mean, it's if you're asking about artists curating versus a curator curating, you know, I think sometimes artists, we, we like to see where artists go, you know, and kind of letting artists play or try things that maybe we haven't done. Um, I think there was a lot of pressure on institutional curators to do things a certain way that I'm also trying to loosen up and let us be a little bit more experimental in how we try things just like we've let artists do in the spaces. I just think what we do, you know, we are a space of learning and we have to try things and experiment in order to learn what works and, and to push a little and see and sometimes it's not going to work and that's okay but it's worth trying um, is my, my philosophy. That's okay. I could ask a, la a last question yeah. about um, about the exhibition, about say the politics of the exhibition, and the importance of sharing these stories and having this frame about um, practices that continue, and also that next to the fact that you have artists of color and white artists in the exhibit, and how you think about that position relative to so much of the other work you've done in terms of diversity in museums. Yeah, well, I thought I thought it was actually interesting in looking at the Cramlet collection. And again, just finding the artists and the work, starting with, with that, um, that it was, it was three white male artists who were kind of, you know, critiquing 
this um, exploitation of the land and its repercussions, both on an environmental and human humanitarian scale. And, and, you know, thinking about, I didn't make it so explicit in the gallery text, again, because of, I think, time, maybe with more time, we could have done it more sensitively or overtly. Um, but I do think it is important that we are, um, that, that there are white male artists who are using their platform to critique a system that they have, you know, generally as a whole benefited from. Um, but then also thinking, and this is where, you know, with the compression of time and everything, I wanted there to be a counterpoint with black artists um, in, a, in a kind of balanced way. Um, I think Carrie Mae Weems is a great, it's, it's integral to her work. This is the other thing is that I never want to force issues onto an artist in their work that isn't in the work. So trying to let the work speak for itself and through juxtaposition and placement kind of create the narrative and the, and the, the tie-ins. Um, but yeah, having also, you know, Steve McQueen, who is a British Korean, Afro-British Caribbean artist and not African-American. Also, that thinking about the black diaspora and how communities um, descendant from sites in Africa are all over and have also perspectives as I know a British man, he has a distinct perspective than an African American, uh, black American would. And, uh, and, and I, I thought it was really interesting that he was speaking about an American history too. Um, so yeah, I think, I think, I don't know what else to say about that, but that it's, it's there for a reason. And I think having, uh, and also actually in the early stages of writing about the, the show, I did call out I did name them as white artists, right, in, in the description, um, because we never do that. We never call white artists white artists. We only call black artists black artists and Latino artists Latino artists. Um, so it, it was something that I thought, oh, what if we did this? But it, it kind of opened up a can of worms that, again, in the compression of time, I felt like I couldn't sensitively handle in the writing and the labels. But I, I do open it up for, you know, discussion and conversation. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, in part because you also say, now that the exhibition is up, there's a whole chance to learn and sit and for the exhibition to become whatever it's going to be, uh, thanks to our reception and our engagement with it. It also was, as you say, a chance for BMPFA to learn what it meant to actually put up work like this at all. Mm -hmm. So a, a context of learning for everyone. Um, I want to thank Julie so much for uh, speaking today, but also before closing to make sure that everyone knows that in the upcoming series, we have two more lectures that will take us even farther in, and in different ways around this, um, this uh, exhibition and its content. Next Thursday, we have William Kentridge himself speaking in dialogue with Judith Butler in a conversation moderated by me. It does look like we'll have about 50 or 60 extra tickets that we'll be able to make available to the public, and we'll look forward to being able to figure out how to do that. Um, also, following uh, Julie's colleagues, our colleagues, Kate McKay and uh, Susan Oxtoby, are going to be, um, each have curated a film series inside of um, the PFA that corresponds to the video art exhibitions in the galleries. Um, and so please come back in two weeks to listen to how they think about the relationship um, between the gallery and the screen and also these major artists. I hope you'll come back and I hope for now you might, hopefully everyone has a sticker, uh, stow your water bottles so that they're not out in the galleries hide, uh, stow really big umbrellas. That's what I'm going to do. And we'll all go back, go into the galleries, into Out of Africa, but not before thanking Julie rodriguez Wilhelm <laughs> for you. her incredible speech today and her time. Thank you. I also want to plug our student committee. If anyone's interested, we have an amazing stu BAM PFA student committee. They do a lot of activities, super fun. It's not just art majors. It's people of all majors um, who meet and do all kinds of cool activities here. So yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you.